So, um, hi everyone. Moi, Olen Susie Thomas. Per Olen Museologian Uliopiston Lettery, Helsingin Uliopistossa. And I won't do the rest in Finnish, I just have to practice all the time. And I also have to apologise on behalf of my colleague Ola Seitsonen, who actually is Finnish and should have been here as well, but was unable to attend. So you've just got me, I'm afraid. But we wanted to talk to you, and this is a very much a co-authored presentation uh, about what we've been doing up in Finnish Lapland and the project we've been working on for the last couple of years named Lapland's Dark Heritage. This has been a um, very interdisciplinary research project. It is an academic research project. It's funded by the Academy of Finland, which is the main academic funder for Finnish research and Finland-based research. Uh, but we've had a very sort of um, very much a public focus with what we've been doing um, for reasons which I hope will become apparent. And one of the things um, that we've done twice so far, and we're hoping to repeat again next year, is have a public slash community investigation of archaeological sites connected to the project we're working on. And, and it's something that we've uh, been doing and, and hoping to continue. Uh, to give you a bit of a background first, though, uh, the project is called Lapland's Dark Heritage, uh, we're very pleased with the project name, and, and clearly the funders were too, because they decided to give us funding for it. Um, it's not just a sort of nice-sounding soundbite, though. It is very much uh, an area of interest and debate in current cultural heritage studies, and also in tourism studies. And it actually derives, arguably, from the slightly older um, area of interest that started to develop in the 1990s of dark tourism. And this is quite a useful schematic that we often come back to um, from Philip Stone, a, a, a dark tourism expert from the University of Central Lancashire, uh, which is um, really sort of trying to conceptualise this idea of, of sites connected with, with dark histories, with difficult pasts. And, and Stone argues that sites can have different levels of darkness depending on where they are, depending on the temporal relationship that we have to the events that they are connected to. Uh, they're almost always sites of atrocity, uh, and Stone argues that the darkest of dark tourism sites are, as you'd probably guess, the death camps. Um, a site can also transition and become lighter or darker, depending on how it's treated. So, especially with tourism sites, the more commodified they come, the more uh, prepared for consumption that they become in some ways they become lighter as well, they become less, if you like, authentic. In the same way a museum exhibition about something isn't as dark as the actual location where the event took place because it's not got that geographical connection. And some of these ideas we think can also be extrapolated onto heritage more broadly. Obviously heritage is more than a tourist attraction, that's often an important element, but it means a lot more to different people too. Uh, and it can be for family connections, for local interests, for a sense of place, as we've been discussing already today, and so on. Give you a bit of the background information. Uh, this is another uh, sort of area of interest around the German military experience of war. And in this, on this case, unlike uh, World War I in the previous paper, this is uh, Second World War. And Finland has quite a sort of interesting history during this time during this period. Although Finland were never formally allied with Nazi Germany, they were what were known as co-belligerents, so they did sort of um, cooperate in various ways. A lot of this was to do with the 1939 invasion of Finland by the Soviet Union and the beginning of the Winter War, um, which obviously, although it ended quite quickly, it became very apparent that war with Soviet Union was bound to start again soon, and so it was important to find support and help as, as a very small nation with that. And uh, so Finland cooperated with Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, which was this idea of invading Soviet Union from the, from the north, from the Arctic. And more than 200,000 German soldiers became stationed in Finland, mainly in the north of the country, in, in Finnish Lapland, and the areas just to the south of there. Uh, locally, it was quite a positive period in some ways. Uh, actual 
fighting was quite limited. It ended up that uh, the German soldiers weren't particularly well prepared for Arctic conditions, and so it was quite stationary in terms of actual conflict. But there was a lot of development economically that happened. Roads and infrastructure were built. Uh, there was talk of the, the Lapland salary that you could actually get paid quite a lot if you were prepared to labour up in the north. And as you can see from the photos, a lot of other kinds of friendships developed as well during that time. Uh, however, in 1944, things changed after the so-called Continuation War, which was sort of the next fight with Soviet Union after the Winter War. Um, Finland had to sign an agreement with the Soviet Union to expel the German soldiers from the Finnish territory. And this meant that the former brothers in arms were suddenly enemies. This led to what was known as the Lapland War. Uh, don't worry if you've not heard of it, not many people have. Um, it's not as famous even within the Finnish sort of official narrative of Second World War. It's not as well known as the Winter War or the Continuation War, which is sort of seen as these heroic battles against the, the huge enemy to the east. Whereas Lapland War um, was quite, a, quite an awkward war in many ways. Um, I've just on the slides there got the statistics, so you can see a lot of the material damage. Uh, the photograph here. Is there a pointer? Maybe the Okay, I can use the mouse. Okay, so this top photo is actually the city of Rovaniemi, which is the largest city in Lapland. And you can see it was really just re reduced to chimneys and, and random parts of building. And you can see the anger. This is a sign left by German troops. A thank you for nothing, so-called brothers in arms. And there's a real sense of betrayal as they uh, left Finland and, and literally destroyed everything in their path. So a lot of um, older architecture and, and other heritage is, is just not there anymore in Finnish Lapland as a result of this. Very few um, casualties. People did die, but not, not so many as, as you maybe would expect, but it was really material damage that took place, and there was a lot of psychological upset. People were evacuated very quickly, and uh, there were a lot of difficulties with that too. As a result of that, there's really rather bipolar memories within the sort of Finnish national feeling about this period. Um, as my colleague Vesepeka Herver said in, a, in an article in 2014, on the one hand, there's this perception of good Germans who provided Finland with much-needed help in a difficult time. But on the other hand, there's the embarrassment that Finland, first of all, sided with Nazis, who furthermore ended up burning down Lapland. And Finns have been anxious to distance themselves from the German war efforts ever since the war. So it is sort of a very difficult history for many people still to reconcile, although research is beginning to look at it a little bit more and there's been a little bit more popular interest as well. So this is where our project comes in, Lapland's Dark Heritage. We have three main research questions, I'll just put them up on there. Uh, essentially, to get an idea, uh, we are looking at the archaeology and the history, but we're more than that looking at the heritage and you know the idea that heritage is, is archaeology and history and the past, but it's also how all of those things are perceived in the present and, and what people feel about this material heritage. There's a lot of remains, although things were destroyed, you get remnants in the forest and so-called war junk from this period that people are still finding on a daily basis. And so we're interested as well in, in how people engage with this material and, and why they do that. And then finally, what kinds of values are there to the Second World War material heritage and, and what could, kind of function could this serve, whether it's touristic or, or otherwise. So we've had uh, quite a, a range of different um, activities and, and research approaches as part of this project. It's a team, uh, several of us uh, coming from different backgrounds. Uh, my own background, uh, I did train as an archaeologist, but I teach museum studies now, so kind of sort of museological perspective, how are things interpreted what's the official history that's displayed at museums and other places where people go to find out about the past. Um, we also have an ethnologist on the team who 
is uh, specialising in ethnographic research, so doing all of the um, observation of people and interviewing people about their experiences and so on. And of course we have archaeologists and, and cultural heritage specialists as well. Um, so one of the things we were quite interested in, in doing was um, having some kind of public excavation up in Finnish Lapland. I should say as a bit of background to this that although there are some opportunities to engage with archaeological heritage in Finland, it's not the same as in the United Kingdom. So there isn't that tradition of local community archaeology groups going out uh, by themselves and, and developing their own research agendas and, and calling on professional assistance as and how they need it. So that isn't the same. It's not the same kind of context in Finland. So actually having an opportunity to engage in archaeology yourself as a, as a non-archaeologist is relatively unusual still in Finland. It's not completely unheard of, but it's unusual. So we had a first excavation in 2016 in a village called Inari, which is several hours north of the Arctic Circle, in, in the village uh, which is also the Sami capital of Finland. So this is where the indigenous Sami people live. And our partner was the Sami Museum, Sida, that helped us organise this excavation. And we excavated a, a military hospital site just to the side of Inari. Um, previous to this, the site was really only known to some of the local villagers who remembered or had been told by parents and other relatives that there'd been a military hospital on site. Uh, there's very little record of a lot of the activities because one of the things that happened when the Germans retreated was they also burnt records. So it wasn't just buildings, it was also plans and, and records that disappeared. So this is another time when archaeology does step in where history can't. Um, we were really surprised at the popularity of this first excavation. Uh, we took on about 12 volunteers. We didn't want too many for safety reasons. We wanted to make sure everybody had enough supervision and so on. And um, within six hours of announcing the spaces online, it was fully booked. So people were quite quick to, to join. And of course, we had this ethnographic component. So we were interviewing the volunteers with their consent. Uh, we were talking with them about their perspectives and also talking to local villagers. Um, some of the volunteers were local, others had travelled from further afield, such as the south of Finland, because they really wanted to be involved. Uh, some of the villagers didn't want to excavate, but they did want to be involved in other ways. So we had regular visitors to the site and people wanting to share their recollections and, and other stories that they'd heard about the site. So there's another picture there. You can see the weather was, of course, as fantastic as you'd expect it to be north of the Arctic Circle in August. This year we had another excavation in Aridig 2, we called it, imaginatively. Uh, this is at a different site, still um, on the outskirts of Inari village at a place called Huyalahti, um, a couple of mile, a couple of kilometres further north, again with, with Cedar as our partner. Um, of the volunteers, five of them came back again. Uh, this included two med medical doctors from the south who were particularly interested the previous years because they were also interested in medical history and they were actually invaluable for helping us identify some of the medical equipment that was being found. Uh, and, and we found every year that people bring expertise, and I, and I think I'm really preaching to the converted when I say this, because you all know that people who aren't archaeologists actually bring a lot more to the table a lot of the time and bring a lot of other experience and knowledge that, that if archaeologists were doing it on their own, they just wouldn't have. Uh, this year we also had two professional conservators volunteer who, they were Finnish, but they lived in Sweden and they came across to excavate with us. Uh, we also had a retired criminal policeman who had been a specialist in forensic recovery. So we had a real wealth of different expertise working with us. Uh, as with the previous year, we had a lot of media interest. Now, there's a film as well, but I'm not going to show it because I think there isn't time. I might put it on afterwards or I can share the link. We have a, a YouTube channel, actually, with several films of things we've been doing. So if anybody's interested, I can share that information. This site, unlike the previous one, which was quite clearly a hospital site and, and, and also in, in original Inari Dig, 
we found a lot of evidence for burning, so we found glass that had melted and so on. This time, um, according to historians and sort of received wisdom, the site we were on was supposed to be a German-run POW punishment camp, so not for German prisoners, because they were the, the friends in this case, something as a Brit I have to keep reminding myself in the, the context of Finland, it's the, the kind of the other side of the coin, if you like. But for prisoners of war from uh, primarily Soviet Union, uh, this camp, uh, what information there was, uh, suggested it was especially for Jewish prisoners of war, and it was a punishment camp, so it was somewhere you were taken if you'd not been behaving properly. Um, but the excavation suggested that the site uh, we previously believed to be that wasn't necessarily that. The, the structures that we found and also the local memories of people in the area don't support that sort of official historical interpretation. Uh, one of our volunteers actually took it upon herself to explore further afield and, and found a few kilometres further north a site that's much more likely to have been um, this kind of punishment camp and you can see on the trees here they're still wrapped with barbed wire and you could start to map out that maybe this was some kind of boundary within the forest so this seems uh, that it's more likely to have been the site we thought we were looking for which is also good news because it means we can go back maybe again and, and explore further another year this is just some of the, the media interest we've had um, so we made it on to uh, national and local news in Finland. Uh, this also gives you, uh, with the map of Finland, of northern Finland, we were around here. This is Inari, so, and this is the Arctic Ocean up here. Um, we also made it into international news, so we were covered in Russia, in Poland. Uh, there's a newspaper in Canada called Canada and Sanomat, which is in Finnish, and it's for the Finnish diaspora living in Canada. They were also interested. And, and we found, and I think this is something that you get when you work with um, a range of different people, some quite interesting other interpretations too, um, as you often get with sites of conflict. And I think, Andy, we've discussed that there's also been discussions of haunting and that kind of thing at, at Stobbs Camp as well. Um, that there are local stories and there are local ghost sightings. And, and of course, as you probably would expect, um, sites, especially prisoner of war camps, are seen as evil places. They're still People have a bad feeling when they go to these places. Within the context of northern Finland, there's also larger issues. Um, there's an issue of colonialism. It's an indigenous Sami territory, and, and many do feel that they are being occupied by Finland. And there was a massive impact on... Sami ways of life due to the war and, and things changed quite a bit afterwards for, for many people and, and of course having these connections to Germans as well and there's, there's um, a number of um, groups formed nowadays in Finland for the offspring of German soldiers and this was again something that maybe wasn't talked about for a long time but now people are starting to try and explore that a bit more closely and, and reconcile with, with what that means for identity and, and family ties and so on. One particularly interesting thing that happened after the first excavation we did in Inari was a, a real haunting experience. And one of the volunteers had visited another prisoner of war camp. And you can see in the picture here, this is the remains of one of the huts. So in some places, there is quite stunning material still still visible and there's still structures of it. Um, that are visible. And this is at the site called Kankanyemi, which is a little bit south of Inari village. And um, so this volunteer had explored and, and had a very strong feeling of experiencing a haunting, and she's quite certain that she encountered the ghost of a Soviet prisoner. Uh, this was followed up later by a dream uh, to one of her relatives with the message that there's many of us um, still in the forest. So it was a very powerful experience and it got to the point that um, it was eventually by October of 2016 arranged to have a special ceremony to help this particular camp and um, an Orthodox cross was raised and a memorial service took place. Um, now there is an Orthodox priest locally, uh, there's a particular ethnic minority within the Sami called the Skolt Sami 
who were originally in an area called Petsamo, uh, just to the east of where we were. And this was part of Finland that was, um, um, what's the word? Taken, I guess. Um, ceded, that's the word. It was ceded to the Soviet Union. And the, the Finnish and Sami residents were evacuated to what was left of Finland. And so the Skolt Sami were displaced from their traditional land and there's now a very small community in eastern Lapland and, and they are um, orthodox by faith so they have an orthodox priest and so the Skolt Sami orthodox priest came and did this ceremony um, I wasn't able to go unfortunately but a couple of my colleagues did come up from Helsinki because we were all invited to this ceremony and there were also quite a lot of <coughs> local residents uh, and even some local media came and they had this memorial service, which, in, as we learnt in, in Orthodox thinking, um, actually sent um, positive vibes back in time. So the reasoning was that by, by having this memorial service now, it was actually sending peace back so that the suffering of the people there in the 1940s would have been lessened. So this sort of idea of being able to travel across time, which I think is really... Fascinating. It also, on a practical level, stops the site from being haunted in the present. So that was another reason to do this. So, so putting a cross there actually takes away the sort of bad vibes that would have been previously there by being um, a prisoner of war camp. So in terms of what we're going to be doing in the future, uh, we do want to return to Lapland next year. Unfortunately, the Academy of Finland grant runs out, so we're in the situation of looking for more funding to do more. Um, we're hoping we can do Dig Sudankula, which is a little bit south of Inari. And this would be focusing around Vortso, which is in the municipality of Sudankula. And it's the southernmost of the Sami villages in Finland and also has a very large um, German base and POW camp around the site. And as you can see from the pictures, a lot of the things are still very visible in the forest. Uh, we're hoping to partner with the local school and again with CEDA. Um, some of the volunteers are interested in being involved, so the conservators who volunteered may come back to actually run their own workshop about conservation. And uh, there's interest as well from the Museum Gallery El Ariesto, which is um, one of the main museums in the area in the town of Sudankula, also in hosting uh, an exhibition as a result. So we see this as going on. Um, I think it's fair to say that everybody that's involved with this project would happily keep doing this for the rest of our careers. And, and there's also that feeling when you start to work with local communities that you don't want to stop that relationship. You want to be able to keep going back and, and doing more with people and hopefully giving them the impetus to conduct more ex in, um, investigations themselves. But of course, it, it does depend on money. So that's just a fairly quick overview, I guess. Um, there's more information if you want to find it. We're, we're very social media active. Um, thank you. Peter.